Liar. Everywhere. On NetworksRadio.com. David Waltman. Kegra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waltman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Thursday, October 17th, 2024. Time for another show. Almost time to wrap up the week. Uh, Greg Dworkin has wrapped up his week. He's got some errands keeping him away from the microphone today. But hey, that means more news for us. That's right. We can all uh, hog up a bigger portion of today's news stories. Of course, we'll get a bigger selection on Monday when Greg comes back. Not only because the weekend will have passed, but because Greg gathers news and loves to bring it to you. And I like to tell you what's falling off of the tree nearby. Two different approaches to things, but that way, uh, well, in each case, I guess, the news feed is curated. Uh, three days a week, ordinarily, by Greg, and uh, two days a week, or in this case, three days a week, uh, by you. Uh, many of you who are listening and uh, participating in the social media scene and sharing the stories important to you. And uh, occasionally you run into things like this. I uh, probably would have missed this one. Joshua Holland, who shares this on Blue Sky, uh, a, um, a, a journalist and uh, also, well, burned out, as he says, political writer and podcast and radio talker. So a little bit like me in that respect, although he probably organizes his show and knows what he's doing beforehand. And maybe one of the things he's preparing to talk about is his Blue Sky post about this being the second anniversary. Happy second anniversary, he says, of this banger. That is the banger headline that he uh, reveals to all who celebrate our standard online, very online meme type line. This is a Bloomberg News headline. What's the date on this thing? Well, I mean, what's today's date? It's October 17th. So second anniversary, October 17th, 2022, just in time to make headlines for the midterm elections at that point. The headline reads, forecast for U.S. recession within year. That is one year. It's now two years since this. But forecast for U.S. recession within a year hits 100% in blow to Biden. Of course, everything's a blow for, for Biden, and Darth was pointing that out. Of course, they would. Uh, when would Bloomberg ever put a 100% chance on anything, unless, of course, it was a blow to Biden, in which case they would trot it straight out? Uh, I, of course, have always been told that Bloomberg 100% blows, and uh, it appears that it, it rolls out uh, just as expected. Many people have told me this. But big, strong guys, tears streaming down their eyes, have never cried in their lives. They're very tough. Uh, they are uh, marine police weightlifter uh, boxers, and they never cry. So you know how it goes. All right. Well, that never materialized, of course. We gave them an extra year, of course. You have to give them an extra year. They said it would happen 100% within one year, but uh, Saddam had one year to hide the recession, and we needed one year then to look for the recession. Do you remember when that was the excuse, by the way, that uh, after invading Iraq with the 100% chance that we would be uncovering their uh, socked away stores of weapons of mass destruction. And we didn't. And the excuse was, well, Saddam had 12 years to hide his WMD, so we need 12 years to look for them. Like, it's interesting. Like, it's a, I've never really heard of this sort of hide-and-go-seek principle of foreign policy before, where however long the bad guy has had to perpetrate the wrong. We have that long to prove that it actually happened or do something about it or find the thing. Count to 100. And then, I, I don't know, that was really absurd. I don't know if we called that out in real time, how crazy a notion that really was. That was a very Donald Trumpian notion. He had 12 years, so why, why don't I get 12? I, I guess that's it. All right, well, we have a couple of other things to clear up. Trump did some more things. And that's always a crushing disappointment for us here in America. And uh, there's nothing more show-worthy than the crushing disappointment for America produced by Donald Trump. That's what we spend our time on. Let's see. He went on <clears throat> Univision, Univision to American-speaking English-type guys. And shouldn't that really be everybody? Get the hell out of our country. And, uh, and that's where he went. 
which is amazing. And he took that message to them. And at one point complained, of course, about the Haitian immigrants in and around Springfield, Ohio, and did a whole thing about how they don't speak our language. You can't just come here and wreck our country. He's saying to a, a room full of Spanish language television watchers here in the United States. But I don't, yeah, he wasn't there to win them over. But we keep finding out that more and more, more and more every day, people are telling me the Hispanics, I love the Hispanic. They love us. We love them. It's very beautiful. And that somehow he's increasing his share there. Still losing them overwhelmingly. And I guess last night is a great example. Why? Uh, I don't know if I parked any of these in uh, pocket or not. But he, you know, spent a good deal of time doing exactly that. I think we, I'm, let me take a look at what's in here. Some of these are, are hidden. There we are. Yeah, actually, some blue sky posts from Matt Novak. Uh, known as Paleo Future on Blue Sky, a tech reporter at Gizmodo. And uh, he uh, watched the Univision uh, extravaganza so that you wouldn't have to, I guess, you know, as the saying goes. During the Univision town hall, Trump got a good question about January 6th, but one part Really stuck out. Shall we roll that? How long does this uh, clip run? Are we going to get in trouble? No, only 39 seconds. 39 beautiful, beautiful seconds. Let's uh, engineer that one up. Uh, uh, Greg is not here to push me to do this. So this is 100% totally organic. Fantastic. All right, let's see. So it's on Blue Sky. We'll go to the original. You know how this exercise goes. It takes me a few seconds to turn up the sound on everything to make sure that... Uh, it's going to be sufficiently loud. Sometimes the clips circulating on on uh, social media not particularly uh, loud. Let's see. So let's. He is uh, asked about January six, and one part really stuck out. Trump responded. I'll call it out for you. Although you know you'll hear it. Trump respond. Well, I don't know. Maybe we just play it. Uh, but it was this. This clip was circulated. Uh, as much for what he said as for the reaction he got. I guess this is his questioner, and it's a split screen. His questioner is a gentleman uh, with his head cocked in apparent disbelief, uh, gl- you know, rolling eyes up, looking at him, kind of. And there's some other audience reaction of people just like, what, what did he even just say? And I guess you got to hear it. Let's let's see if we can. Where they came. There we are. Some of those people went down to the Capitol. I said, Peacefully and patriotically. Nothing done wrong at all. Nothing, Nothing huh? done wrong. And uh, action was taken. Strong action. Ashley Babbitt was killed. Nobody was killed. Uh, th- that's that's the part. <laughs> There's a sudden head twitch, like little or old double take, you know, with the, uh, you know, uh, head shake and scowl. I mean, by the way. The audience that they're panning up at the top, it looks like three women sitting side by side. There's several, uh, but three in the top row, maybe, of the risers. And they are all scowling with their arms crossed. <laughs> it is body language mania going on here. And, of course, it's like I said, the questioner is like, come on, give me a break. And what gets the double take is Ashley Babbitt was killed. Nobody was killed. Uh, which... You know, in his brain is the only person who was killed was one of my people, Ashley Babbitt. Nobody on the other side was killed, which is him saying, that's how you know nothing went wrong. Nobody, you know, what are, what are you crying about? Nobody was killed. Some only people who was killed was on our side. But, of course, this is how he puts together the thought. Ashley Babbitt was killed. Nobody was killed. Yaggity, yaggity. What? All right. So we'll continue on from there. No, I'll, I'll just want to watch the double take again. Uh, there were no guns down there. Yeah, we didn't have guns. The others had guns, but we didn't have guns. And we. Uh, when I say we, these are people that walked down. This was a tiny percentage of the overall, which nobody sees and nobody nobody shows. Again, not completing the sentence. Uh, I'm occasionally guilty of that, but uh, nobody sees, nobody sh- uh Anyway, nobody, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he's just, you know, he's a babbling mess. What is he going to say about January 6th to impress this audience? I, uh, it's a tough call, but okay. But that was a day of love from the standpoint of the millions. It's like hundreds. <laughs> that got the double take from the questioner. That was a day of love. And the guy just bobs his head to the other side like, what did you just say? You guys, it's a very visual element to this. But okay. I'm playing the it's audio. Thousands. It could have been the largest group I've ever spoken before. Another they asked lie. me to speak. I went and I spoke. 
I like Boy, that can. too. Uh, so, uh, the, so he bears no responsibility for it. I take no responsibility for it whatsoever, just like with COVID. I don't know anything about it. They asked me to speak, and I went and I spoke. This is the rally that he was saying, you know, be there January 6th, will be wild. Right. I don't know what happened. I was just walking around, minding my own business, handing over power peacefully. And they interrupted my breakfast and said, sir, tears streaming down their eyes. Big, strong guys never cry. They said to me, sir, will you speak to our rally? It's the largest crowd we've ever assembled for you. The people of America await. So I said, OK, I'll go and I'll tell them. Uh, how are you? Have a good day. You're so beautiful. Such patriots. Please. Have a day of love and peace. Some of you guns, maybe, but one of you, uh, everybody else have a great day. Ashley Babbitt, uh, you're going to get killed, but the rest of you have a great day. And uh, quite frankly, you're going to get killed in a great way. So it's all right. Uh, I don't know. So it was it was really something watching the clip that came out of that. and then, uh, But certainly there was a lot of reaction around uh, the Internet and, and everywhere. To the idea that, of course, uh, well, January 6th did nothing wrong, peace and love, et cetera, et cetera. And he may or may not actually believe that in his own head. Uh, but at this point, it, it's kind of hardly worth talking about what he might believe in his own head. It's uh, It doesn't bear any resemblance to, you know, the, the, the reality that you and I live in. So to some extent, <clears throat> not, uh, not the most worthy of pursuits. All right. Well. Oh, there are semi-worthy pursuits out there. There was another one. This one, I think, was... This must have been mm, Tuesday night, perhaps? I think Greg mentioned this one. I, I'm starting to lose track of which garbage town hall it is that he's doing. They're all sort of the same events. If it's not a rally, it's a it's a town hall-style thing. And, you know, there are a couple, so we can't say he's doing no events. But besides this Univision one... There was a Fox News one. It was pre-taped and edited, so they did their best to sane wash everything and string together, I guess, sentences and uh, make it look as so. There was the dance hall one, and then the Fox News, this one, the all-female Fox News town hall, which is interesting. I don't really know why exactly it's billed that way. I definitely see uh, people in the audience that look like they might, you know, might not identify as female, but I guess the idea was that they were going to focus on women's issues, which is, you know, the majority of the population. But anyway, their issues. But Trump women's issues, I guess. Not, you know, raping them, but uh, the ones, the issues that they have. When, when I'm going to be a good listener, and you can tell me about all your women problems. Don't tell me about the disgusting ones. And then also at the end, you know, I might grab some, but only because of what a beautiful, terrific, wonderful, patriotic, loving woman you are. Uh, I, I have I have Amanda Marcotte <laughs> on that. And really, where else do you want to go? The headline grabber from this one, and, and I think Greg mentioned this uh, or a, an outtake, at least, from this one. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't, like I said, I didn't keep it straight, and then I read this morning. Oh, my God, he did another? It's interesting. They're, they're keeping it moving. It's a lot of Adderall to keep doing this, but uh, this one was mentioned by Greg. I forget exactly what the context was for that one, but maybe it'll come up as we read through her piece in the Salon. Here's your headline, a quote from Trump. We want fertilization. That's the way to talk to women. Yeah. Uh, her thesis in this, by the way, is that this was not for women. This was another event for the men in the MAGA world. One, uh, the big one man at the center of it, Trump, to reassure him that women love me. And then to remind the white young white male voters who, for whatever reason, are, are sold on Trump. And, and mostly it's because going back a couple of years here, but mostly because it's a sex cult. Uh, Donald Trump and the Trump administration will permit you to uh, go caveman, I guess, in your quest to get laid. And it'll all work out for you, even if you're an incel. Uh, things will be great for you because it'll be okay in America to club women over the head and drag them by their hair back to your cave again. As long as it's a an actual, it's not an actual cave. It's a it's a basement, the man cave. If you drag them to an actual cave, you're Osama bin Laden, and you know we have a problem. Anyway, 
Uh, like I said, this is a great way to talk to women. So guys, if you're young men out uh, looking for that soulmate, you might want to try this line at the next happy hour or uh, outing, whatever it is, wherever you gather to try to meet potential life partners or, or just someone to have a good time with, whatever that may mean to you, do tell them straight up. And, and, and you want to make it an open in a conversation. We want fertilization. And uh, the, as they said back in the day, the chicks really dig it. Now, Trump's all-female Fox News town hall wasn't for women, says Amanda Marcotte, but his male base, as everything is in Donald Trump world. Trump called himself the father of IVF. I invented it, as everybody knows, plus vaccines. My uncle, very smart, went to MIT. I, uh, people say they want the IVF, and they, you know, they're the Democrats. They're such liars. They're so bad. They're so evil. They were saying, we didn't want the IVF. We were going to block the IVF. Ban it. But I am the father of IVF. You're not. You're not. You're not. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you about this one, but okay. But then, not only said he, did he say he was the father of IVF, but then he admitted he asked Katie Britt to tell him what it is. Ah, uh, was uh, it's interesting. So, is this in? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out wh- why would he why would he say that? And the answer is that um, Katie Britt. It, or this event was held in South Carolina. Okay, and so I guess he needed like a southern. Well, maybe she was there with him. I don't know. She's the the junior, I guess, senator from Alabama. It's hard to remember who even represents Alabama in uh, in the Senate, but uh, and I don't know. So I guess she's a and she's got herself. She was, I think, one of the people we looked at for the example of the baby fundy voice. Uh, do you remember her? I mean, she's not particularly memorable so far as a senator, but I guess that's like, uh, that's an okay ticket there, right? I asked a Southern white woman senator, what is this IVF? And it's okay. She's popular here. That's why I asked her. He probably never did ask her. So that may be a lie in and of itself. Anyway, this is Amanda's take on things. Donald Trump is so scared of questions these days that he doesn't just cancel interviews. That's happening all over the place. He will stand and sway to music for 39 minutes rather than answer the inquiries of his rally attendees, his own rally attendees. Still, in an odd choice for a campaign canceling interviews faster than they can book them, Trump's team did allow him to sit for an all-female town hall. Not really sure why they call it that, but they do. His staff did everything they could to make it easy on the increasingly addled old old man. They scheduled it on Fox News rather than a legitimate news network. Good dig. It was pre-taped and edited, unlike the unedited interview Fox News just did with Vice President Kamala Harris, the other big interview news of the day. And the host, Harris Faulkner, has legitimately impressive skills at cutting him off and redirecting his attention without triggering a tantrum. She's got the secret I guess, suggesting that she would be a crackerjack at handling the worst dementia patients at a care facility. Right away, the town hall felt less like Trump trying to appeal to female voters and more like his campaign trying to reassure the notoriously fragile candidate that women don't hate him. It was immediately obvious that audience members were chosen for their loyalty to Trump. One participant even joked that it's a, quote, Room full of women the current administration would consider domestic terrorists, which is to say they aren't just Republicans, but ready to volunteer for the next January 6th. This line drew gushing applause because on Fox News, feminism, quote unquote, is reminding viewers that women can be fascists, too. The next hour was built around Trump's main, soul, really, pitch to women. If they don't vote for him, they will be raped and murdered by dark-skinned immigrants. Da 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 da. There you go. That's uh, so. It's two choices, uh, one or the other. He argued at one point that immigrants have such allegedly superhuman strength that they are literally picking up refrigerators and walking out of stores with them. That is a new one for me. While cops, in his lurid fantasy, are standing by for some reason. He loves the cops. But th- these ones are standing by. But we love the way they stand by, very patriotically, peacefully. Uh, forbidden, of course, by woke city leaders from stopping crimes in action. 
As usual with his bizarre lies, Trump claimed to have seen this on a video with his own eyes. That is to say, not with his own eyes, but rather watching a video. Of course, since it's physically impossible, the fact-checking performs itself. At no point did host Faulkner mention that two separate juries have found that E. Jean Carroll was telling the truth when she said Trump raped her in the 90s, nor was there any danger of this heavily curated audience of MAGA loyalists reminding viewers that Trump, statistically speaking, is far more likely to commit sexual assault than any random immigrant. After all, as Eric Garcia reported for The Independent, the attendees in an intimate setting were from Republican groups around the area whom Fox News invited. There is an embedded Aaron Rupar clip here from this one, uh, speaking on uh, women, uh, trans athletes in women's sports, etc. Uh, also, Aaron pointing out here, not surprising but notable, there is a woman in the crowd literally wearing an RNC delegate hat. <laughs> so, you know, random voters. Uh, and uh, the first question in the Fox Town Hall, according to Matthew Gertz, reporting was went to Lisa, who looks a lot like Lisa Cauley, the president of the Fulton County Republican Women. Uh, even the necklace matches. She's got the same uh, necklace on that she has in her publicity headshot from the county Republican organization. So, you know, anyway, back to the story. In the real world, this election is shaping up to have the biggest voting gender gap in history. The Trump campaign's outreach, quote unquote, outreach to women has been anemic. Multiple experts have argued that the campaign has decided it's a waste of time to court female voters. Instead, Trump is focused on trying to turn out low propensity male voters with a bro centric strategy to make up for his losses with women. And in light of that, it is unlikely that this town hall was not meant for or it is likely, sorry, that it was not meant for a female audience at all. Instead, it's about reassuring Trump's male base that they aren't misogynists even though they back a sexual predator whose only real accomplishment in office was getting abortion rights taken away. This impression is reinforced by the fact that Faulkner deftly controlled Trump when he was threatening to go on rants about the 2020 election or other topics that are unpopular, even with many Republican voters. But when Trump was being creepy to women, she didn't interfere. She did nothing to stop him from leeringly telling one participant that she has a, quote, beautiful voice. She let him gush about how sexually attractive he finds Senator Katie Britt. I guess that's why. Uh, She's very beautiful, like all of you. And I just want to talk about the shape of her body. And it was very... I was asking her about IVF, of course. Uh, There's the clip of him saying, I'm going to see if we can't play this one. I'm the father of IVF. Let's uh, open up Pocket on the other computer. And this will allow us to do it if I can get to the Salon article, and we're going to have to do a couple of clicks here and there, but I guess we can make it work. Uh, oh, yes, right, mental note to myself to remember to turn down the sound before the break comes. Oh, this one is, uh, is this one not giving me the uh, same display here? All right, what I'll have to do is uh, maybe click on this bit here. All right. It's going to take me an extra second. I want to hear the I'm the father of IVF thing. I want to see what what the hell is he doing? What's he talking about here? How does he uh, go about making this claim? And is there any context? I'm curious what kind of inflection he gives it. Let's see if we can't get this one up and on the air. Come on now. Take your time, computer. There's no rush. We're only doing a... All right. Uh, oh, right. First, he's going to talk about Katie Britt being attractive and then where's the ivf one i don't know where's our, our dog I'm, I'm in the aaron rupar feed but i don't know for some reason oh there we are all right the father of ivf okay it's very exciting i can't wait to hear this one uh just 12 seconds it's, it took a hundred years to actually play the thing, but here we go. All right, let's get this question, yeah. because I believe that's what this is about. Oh, I want to talk about IVF. I'm the father of IVF. I'm the father of IVF, so I want to hear this question. Yeah, hi, President. Or IVF. That is interesting. Well, I mean, he's really trying very hard to get that one across. He actually gets interrupted a couple of times by, I don't know, noise and laughter in the audience, but he wants, definitely wants to make an effort to bring that out. I'm, I'm, the, fa- I'm the father. I'm the father. I'm the father. Of IVF. Right. 
Everyone knows him that way. All right, well, anyway, he goes on and then uh, spends a good deal of time talking about how attractive he finds Katie Britt. And then, back to the story, that Trump doesn't care about getting women's votes was made especially evident when, 50 minutes in, uh, the town hall finally touched on the issue of reproductive rights. So finally, I guess we're getting back around to this thing. And uh, this is what must set this up. So reproductive rights. When asked about abortion, it's an hour in a women's town hall to get to reproductive rights. When asked about abortion, Trump rolled out a non-answer about how ending Roe was no big deal, because in some states, people are restoring abortion rights with ballot initiatives. That's his usual excuse for this. I, I sent it back to the states, which is what everyone wanted. Unsurprisingly, Faulkner did not push and ask him if he would sign a national abortion ban. They ask him and uh, Vance that all the time, wherever they go in a normal setting. And they say, no, no, no. But here's you saying you would. Oh, well, you're, you're a liar. As we learned during the debate with Harris last month, the answer is a big fat yes. Nor does leave it to the states do much for women who are bleeding out in parking lots because their state banned abortions, even in cases of emergencies. But things truly got weird when a participant asked Trump about IVF and Trump got both gross and punchy. Hmm. That's interesting, too. But, you know, one of his favorite topics, of course, is uh, fertilization, as we heard up at the top. Uh, where So, like a weary toddler trying to eat spaghetti. <laughs> That's an interesting description of both gross and punchy, as she says. We want fertilization, and it's all the way. What? It's all the way. Eee, Trump said, which is disturbing to read, but even more unsettling in his nasal tone, which makes it sound like a threat. Right, okay. So, it's a very exciting topic. Insemination. Something I really want to talk a lot about. It's terrific. It's great. Everyone loves it, especially me. I'm just it's a peace and love, and it does nothing wrong, even if I don't know you or meet you at a department store. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction, and whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't or at least shouldn't do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon, too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the Ken Gordon Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, yeah, so how do you like that? Trump is the father of IVF. Aaron Rupar uh, also pulls the quote that I guess didn't make it into the clip, but he has the text of it here, and he goes on to say, I'm the father of IVF. We are really the party for IVF. We want fertilization. And it's all the way. And the Democrats tried to attack us on it all the way. That's what you like to hear following up on that subject from Donald Trump. I'm the father of IVF, Trump declared. Fact check. Sir Robert Edwards, a British physiologist, developed in vitro fertilization in the 1970s while Trump was driving around in matching uh, burgundy leisure suit and limousine. But anyway... Uh, he went on, of course, Robert Edwards did, to win the Nobel Prize for his research in 2010. But, of course, common sense tells us that Trump, a man who once suggested bleach injections to cure COVID-19, is barely aware of how human biology works. He is not, as he pretends, a Nobel-level biologist. 
Most tellingly, after implying that he invented IVF, Trump then pivoted to admitting he didn't know what it was. Uh, and that that might be the most likely, that that's the most fatherly thing he's done about it. I mean, in terms of how he's dealt with his actual kids, things and people that he's actually the father of. I actually don't know what that is or who they are. I can't pick them out of a lineup. So, all right. He does not, in fact, understand what IVF is. Listening to him in this interview, it was clear he still doesn't know what IVF stands for, even after months of being asked questions about it. But I do believe him, she says, when he recounts asking Katie Britt to explain it to him. That must have been something. You know, you're really such a beautiful, attractive woman. I got. I have to ask you, uh, can you explain in vitro fertilization to me? I, well, yeah, he won't know the words, but I mean, that's an interesting question. So besides uh, your opening line now being, we want fertilization. How do you feel? Uh, also, right, just as an icebreaker, can you explain... <laughs> IVF to me. No. Anyway, uh, but he says, uh, or, or Amanda Marcotte says, I do believe him when he recounts asking Britt to explain it. I don't know if I do, but okay, let's see why. This brief admission of ignorance was perhaps the only true thing he said in an hour-long interview. I, I'm sure he's telling the truth about, there's. I didn't know what it was, and he still doesn't. But I do wonder whether he did ask Katie Britt about it, or whether he just thought, this is Southern women and the, the only attractive Southern woman politician I can remember is Katie Britt. So I'll tell them that she explained it to me. She's surely one of their heroes, right? Because they're from the same region and Republican. And maybe they're, oh, yes, right. The gender is the same as well. Anyway, uh, so Amanda thinks it was one of the one true things he said in this hour long interview. But it also underscored how little Trump was actually trying to speak to female voters. The overall moral of his story was women keep yapping about it, so we'll promise they can have it and to shut them up. But that promise is a lie. As Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois pointed out on Twitter, Republicans were twice given the opportunity to vote for a bill that protects IVF access and twice they voted against it. Women vote more than men. She reminds us, so it seems unwise of the Trump campaign to treat female voters like a joke, but it also seems clear their candidate is congenitally incapable of viewing women as autonomous human beings. On the campaign trail, he frequently says things like, I always thought women liked me. I never thought I had a problem, but the fake news keeps saying women don't like me. It's not a surprise that most women loathe Trump, who bragged on tape about he routinely commits sexual assault, but... He is also unable to imagine women have minds and that it simply doesn't register that women tend to dislike known sexual assailants. So whether they like it or not, the Trump campaign is stuck with the strategy of talking past women in the hopes that enough men love the misogyny to get off their couches, whatever they may be doing there, and vote. I had to add a little <laughs> to the end of the line there, but I know that's what she was thinking about when uh, she brought that up. All right. So there's that's the score from the all-female, all-women town hall, which was not all women, but doesn't really matter. Uh, who cares? To hell with all of that. All right. Uh, a couple other items uh, hanging around waiting for uh, discussion and um, just trying to weigh them in terms of uh, their importance or their ability to be woven into the uh, ongoing thread here. Uh, hmm. There are a couple of random items here for sure. All right. Well, let's see. Well, for one thing, uh, Scott sent me this. Uh, actually, he sent me two pieces in the last couple of days. One he thought might be good for a Friday. And this is like a Friday. It's a Thursday. And Greg's not here. But well, I don't know whether we'll save it. But uh, this morning... Without reservation, saying that it ought to be a Friday item. Yeah. Uh, he sent me this piece from Wired, uh, which I think frequently is paywalled. So we'll see whether we can get all the way through this one. Oh, it looks like this one is open and available. Uh, although there's a bit of a pop-up issue going on here all of a sudden. But uh, this is, I think, good news for the Trump campaign. 
I think, right? I mean, is this a bad thing? J.D. Vance advisor posted on Reddit for years about use of cocaine, quote, gas station heroin, and other drugs. That's a good thing, right? I, 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 we're, I forget exactly how things go in the United States with Republicans and drug use. But I think since everything is good for Republicans, this is also good news for John McCain. Uh, but... but uh, Let's find out what this is. This is uh, Aaron Kofsky, J.D. Vance's financial policy advisor, which I assume means as campaign financial policy advisor, whether Senate campaign or this campaign, I'm not sure, maybe both, as opposed to like his personal financial advisor. This would be unsurprising but troublesome. Like when I say, uh, my finan- find out my financial advisor is uh, a frequent cocaine user. Uh, right now, you would say, oh, my gosh, that's trouble. If it was the 1980s where Donald Trump's brain is stuck, you would say, of course, your financial advisor is a cocaine user. How do you think he stays up late enough to make manic trades on your behalf? And the whole place is fueled by cocaine. But but now we're supposed to be down on this. Uh, so Aaron Kofsky, J.D. Vance's uh, financial policy advisor, called Vance, by the way. This is another one of these situations. Vance called Trump Hitler. And Kofsky called Vance a Trump bootlicker. <laughs> so it's a party all the way around. And he instructed users of, I guess, Reddit. He's a Redditor. Uh, how to transport drugs through TSA in his posts. And also throws in uh, this observation. Coke, then opiates is always my go-to, he wrote. That seems like a, a bad idea to post anywhere. But, of course, he thought he was doing so anonymously. Uh, one of J.D. Vance's key policy advisors, Aaron Kofsky, has for years posted extensively on Reddit about using a variety of drugs, including cocaine and opiates, under the username Psychotic Mammal. It, it means a great deal. It's just, it's easily as, as smart and impressive sounding as k x obviously. Uh, in case you were ever wondering, as some of you do who don't uh, listen to the, who do listen to the show but never encountered me on social media or old time blogs as K Grow X. Why is this the K Grow in the Morning Show if your name is David Waldman? And the answer is I keep the original K Grow in a man sized safe in the downstairs basement and impersonate him every day. Just for the wildly lucrative radio deal. Uh, in the posts, which are as recent as three months ago, in case you were wondering about that, Kofsky wrote about experiencing withdrawal from and trying to kick what is this? Tian, tianeptine? T, I don't, tianeptine. I have no idea how you pronounce this thing. Uh, I'm kind of curious now. But this is what, what he was referring to as, quote unquote, gas station heroin. I have never heard that uh, phrase, but, you know, I guess it's a thing. Um, but it's got a name and let's go find out what it is. Uh, I'll turn up the sound on the, we'll just do this one on the laptop and see if it gives us uh, a loud enough thing to hear. It was, uh, sounds like this. All right, let's hear it. Tyaneptine. Tyaneptine. Okay. Tyaneptine. Uh, tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. Tyaneptine. Got it. Okay. Want to be sure that I pronounce, I don't want to be caught at the gas station mispronouncing the name of their favorite heroine, but he was trying to kick Tyaneptine known as gas station heroin, and Kratom, Kratom, I don't know how you say that. I've seen that one on signs at the vape stores, uh, the very bright, brightly lit LED uh, display. Kratom, uh, I thought that was a brand of something that they were selling, but I guess not. Uh, uh, anyway, he also advised other users on how to transport drugs on domestic flights, good idea, and called Vance a Trump bootlicker. So he was kind of all over the place. According to his LinkedIn profile, because why not have one, Kofsky, who is in his late 20s, so it, it tracks, I guess, has been advising Vance on financial policy since this past May. That doesn't track. You're in your late 20s, really. What have you done in life at all? But then again, J.D. Vance himself is 15, so I guess it makes some sense. He's also been working in the vice presidential nominee's Senate office since March of last year. 
And he was on drugs the whole time. What do you know? A recent Politico article on Vance's inner circle described Kofsky as helping the senator, quote, flesh out his opposition to some cryptocurrency regulation and his effort to introduce new banking regulations after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, good. It's just, you know, cocaine addled teenagers. No big deal. Before working for Vance, Kofsky worked for the Senate Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee and as a policy advisor to Securities and Exchange Commissioner Mark Uyeda. I don't know how he says that name. Uh, U-Y-E-D-A. Uyeda, perhaps. Uh, Just a couple of prime plum jobs for your basic cocaine addict. No big deal. The crypto industry has seen Vance as an ally since he ran for Senate in 2022 and then disclosed that he personally owned more than $100,000 in Bitcoin. Kofsky has criticized SEC Chair Gary Gensler's heavy-handed approach to crypto regulation multiple times on Twitter. Over the summer, Vance circulated a draft bill that would remove much of the authority the SEC and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission have over governing digital currency. At the time, Politico called the bill... One of the more industry-friendly pieces of legislation. And, of course, don't forget that the real connection there is that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, uh, in its certainly in its initial offerings, uh, my recollection was that this is a great way to anonymously buy, and untraceably, they thought, buy drugs on the dark web. And I guess that's what uh, Aaron spent his time doing. And so it's very important to him. He's having trouble withdrawing from those drugs. And you need to deregulate cryptocurrency so that he can continue to buy his illicit drugs and not be caught and punished like the rest of us. If we were to turn to such things, you know. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, a Wired investigation shows Kofsky is also a the person posting as psychotic mammal. The account has posted personal details that precisely match Kofsky's resume, and it is a very particular resume, and has linked to a little-followed Instagram account dedicated to photos of Kofsky wearing preppy outfits. Hmm. A review of the publicly available material from data breaches provided by Constella Intelligence shows that Kofsky's personal email address was used to set up a Psycho Mammal account. Not Psychotic Mammal, but this one called Psycho Mammal. But again, how likely is that if it's not the same person? Uh, on a photography site. And by the way, I don't believe I called out here. We're reading from Wired Magazine, which I think I did say, but I didn't say that this is a piece by McKenna Kelly. M-A-K-E-N-A, McKenna. McKenna Kelly, uh, Doing the reporting here, so credit where credit is due here. Let's get back down to where we were. Uh, Psycho Mammal was the name he used on this photography site. Furthermore, the psychotic mammal name was used on Poshmark by a user whose avatar is a photo of Kofsky. That does seem to be a dead giveaway, but it could be a big psych op, right? A big psy op to make it look like that, 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 that. And actually, that reminds me, there's a good transitional story. What was that one? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, I make a note to myself about that story and see if I can't find it during the break. Uh, but if if I can find it and report it to big connection here and uh, we'll see if we can remember why we wanted to go to it by the time we get around to this one. So Poshmark. So I guess you use the uh, photography site, I guess one other than Instagram, and um, post pictures of yourself wearing preppy outfits, and then you can go on Poshmark and sell your preppy outfits so that you have money to buy Bitcoin and then can anonymously buy more cocaine and gas station heroin on the interwebs. All right. Seems like a good scheme. Better deregulate it. Uh, it was also used, Psychotic Mammal, the username, on Tumblr by someone who linked to and claimed as his own a blog spot maintained by a user named Aaron Kofsky, just by some coincidence, who posted personal details that matched the details of Aaron Kofsky's biography. Although, I guess if I was faking one up, that's the details I would want to match to. I would look up what's the rest of your social profile, and let's make sure we mention such things. Oh, you sneaky Iranian hackers, you. The posts made by Kofsky stand in stark contrast to Vance's own statements related to drug crime, 
Since being elected to the Senate in 2022, he has positioned himself as a leader in preventing fentanyl trafficking and, as recently as August, has said the Trump-Vance administration would support the use of the death penalty as punishment against drug dealers. And Aronkovsky is okay like that, I'm sure. I'm not dealing, I'm consuming, so you won't be killing me. It's fine. And also, Vance probably, uh, working for Peter Thiel, probably a big part of the same drug finance culture, I would guess. But it's just a guess. Vance, who has spoken at length about fentanyl trafficking, rose to prominence as the author of a book that discussed his mother's drug addiction, which he referenced during his Republican National Convention speech this summer. He also argued that Democrats are letting drugs cross the border from Mexico because that's necessary price of admission to the Donald Trump Republican Party. You have to say that in your speech or uh, you get the death penalty, I guess. After Wired contacted Kofsky for comment, some of Psychotic Mammal's posts about drugs were deleted. What do you know? And that can only happen in either an amazing coincidence or if there's a real connection. And their Poshmark avatar was changed to a picture of characters from the Star Wars movie Attack of the Clones. Sure, why not? Parker Magid, I guess, or, or I don't know whether that's a... a it's M-A-G-I-D, and as a... As a Jewish American, I would say, I guess, Magid somehow. is I don't know if that's actually how it's pronounced. But Parker here, a spokesperson for Vance's Senate office, provided a statement from Kofsky. Uh, like millions of Americans, sure, the statement reads, I've struggled with drug use, which in my case was mostly an attempt to self-medicate against the effects of epilepsy and epilepsy medication. Why see a doctor? When you can self-medicate with gas station heroin that you bought with Bitcoin. That, uh, he's, he's maybe a 20-something, but he wants to stay a 20-something forever. That is to say, my grave marker needs to, you know, indicate that I died in my 20s. Because I'm self-medicating. What's the problem with self-medicating? We just came through a pandemic. Let's self-medicate with hydroxychloroquine. Drink your fish tank. Eat your horse's medicine. No big deal. All right. Uh, like millions of Americans, I'm sure, uh, gotta self-medicate against epilepsy, uh, or rather the medication I take for epilepsy. I did go see a doctor. They gave me medication, but I need to counteract that. I deeply regret posting those comments. That's pretty clear. I'm not proud of this and I'm embarrassed it's being publicized in this way, but I am thankful to say that part of that part of my life is behind me. Hmm. Uh, for the past 11 years, Psychotic Mammal has used Reddit to document their use of a variety of drugs, including cocaine, uh, oh, rationeptine, there's the other one, kratom, which I really don't know anything about, oxycodone, ritalin, and MDMA. What is kratom exactly? I mean, the fact that I see it in neon lights in the windows of vape shops lead, led me to believe that it was not an illicit substance. I actually just thought it was a brand of, I mean, I guess I thought it was like a brand of of paraphernalia or something that they would be selling at this, but I got, I'll look it up. It is a tropical evergreen tree. It's got a scientific name here, but don't ask me to try to pronounce that one. Uh, all right, maybe, uh, no, Mitra, Mitra Gyna, Mitra Gyna, I have no idea. M-I-T-R-A-G-Y-N-A, Mitra Gyna Speciosa. A tropical evergreen tree of the Rubicaceae, uh, Rubia, oh, I'm sorry, Rubiaceae, maybe, I don't know, family, native to Southeast Asia. Get me a Latin speaker in here, or Greek, or I, what is this? That looks like Latin to me. It is indigenous to Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, and Papua New Guinea, where its leaves, known as kratom, have been used in herbal medicine, quote unquote, I guess, since at least the 19th century. So I didn't realize that that is. I guess it's in pill form, it looks like, uh, and sold, uh, can produce an opioid and stimulant-like effect. How exciting. All right. I learned something new every day. Uh, you got to look up what drugs is the financial advisor to the vice presidential nominee for the Republican Party addicted to. And now we know. Also uh, mentioned, right, oxycodone, Ritalin and MDMA, which is terrific. Uh, this is a, an 11 year history in a 20 something. So, you know, 
That's pretty significant. In one post from eight years ago, they listed all the drugs they had tried to that point, rating them on a scale from one to ten. So very teenager sort of thing to do. These drug-related posts have continued while Kofsky has been employed by the Senate. That seems wacky. You'd be amazed at the things they don't discover about people, even though they're publicly confessed to. You think they're monitoring your social media, uh, and sometimes they are, but I guess not with this guy. These drug-related posts are now, the, the, the Wired is monitoring them anyway. These drug-related posts have continued while he's been employed by the Senate. In May of 2022, for example, Psychotic Mammal responded to a post in the Reddit uh, subreddit cocaine subreddit r slash cocaine giving advice on how to smuggle drugs past airport security or senate security i guess putting a bag between the pages of a book or in your wallet is also a safe bet they wrote tsa x-ray machines just show different types of materials as different colors what they're looking for is metal since most book covers also have plastic in them it'll just show up as the same color i've never had an issue hmm well, he's studied it closely. In January, Psychotic Mammal posted a video from a Senate committee hearing in which Vance questions a former DEA agent on the increasing use of, uh, shoot, uh, ni- uh, nitazines. I guess that's related to the, uh, I don't know. I guess it's something new. I haven't run across this one either. Nitazines or manufactured opioids. Is that what they are called? Okay. Kofsky appears in the background in this video. They posted a video on several drug-related subreddits, including r slash opioid rcs, whatever that even means, r slash drugs, r slash opiates, and r slash obscure drugs. Oh, okay. So now it's like he's a drug hipster. I do drugs that you've probably never even heard of. And, And I haven't. Psychotic Mammal also posted it in r slash research chemicals. That's a good euphemism for it. Writing, surprising politician knows about nitazines. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, he's plugging them here, asks witness about nitazines. Is it just me or is this super surprising? I guess it's not surprising if you handed him the question, but uh, like I'm just confused how this guy had heard of zines, as he calls them here. Not magazines, but Nitazines. I can't imagine any of his colleagues know anything about them. Isn't that exciting? A uh, Midwestern teenager whose mom uh, was addicted to drugs knows something about some cool drugs that we like to be addicted to. Isn't that awesome? A different user commented on the post pointing out Kofsky and writing, that dude on the right behind him looks high on something, LOL. And they were right. Psychotic Mammal then agreed with the user. Ha ha, I didn't notice that guy. Wink, wink. Before. His eyes are deaf buggin. Maybe snorted some old, O-L-E, like old white girl beforehand. I'm sure half of Congress rails lines. Oh my God. Wow. All right. Fantastic. Arrest this guy immediately. Later on in the thread, a different user accuses Psychotic Mammal of being Vance because the linked video was unlisted. Unlisted? 21 views? Senator Vance, is that you? That's funny. It's a good guess, but not quite that uh, outrageous, but the next best thing. LOL, I wish. Would love to be rolling in the dough like him and his VC buddies, Psychotic Mammal replied. Honestly, when I first watched this, The thought kind of crossed my mind that maybe he's familiar because he's a fan himself. But I feel like that's doubtful given his politics. So he recognizes the hypocrisy of it, I guess. I'm sure there are a few congressmen who indulge, but I doubt they're using zines like cool people like us use. Or the other RCs, research chemicals, now I understand. Seems like a coke kind of job. Which is, of course, how he was getting through his job. In the comments of a now deleted post on r slash obscure drugs, Psychotic Mammal responding to a user claiming that nitazines are not obscure drugs. <laughs> He's cooler than you. You think they're obscure. They're not obscure. I knew that. I was done with them when you were still experimenting. Well, he called Vance a Trump bootlicker. Okay, that is Psychotic Mammal. All oh, right. Psychotic Mammal was telling that another user that nitazines aren't obscure. Anyway, Vance, don't worry about him. He's a Trump bootlicker. I just can't believe that this Trump bootlicker Vance is ahead of the curve here. 
the comments read. But I guess by that point, he had read the room and realized that the subreddit thought that Vance was a Trump bootlicker, and he and he is. Uh, so he went along with that to, so as not to blow his cover. But isn't it amazing how ahead of the curve this guy is, despite the fact that he's a Trump bootlicker? Wink, wink. Psychotic man will describe numerous instances of drug use in the post stating from the time Kofsky worked for then-Senator Pat Toomey and Vance. I love Coke on its own. I'm a purist. Also, mixed with benzos, mixed with opiates, my fave, TBH. And even love a line or two after smoking a few bowls. Isn't this great? By the way, they're going, we're going to execute all the rest of you. And this guy is helping these guys, these various senators make their policies just on and on about how much he loves mixing his uh, drugs together. Just wonderful. I'd even say that Coke is my second favorite drug behind opiates. They wrote earlier this year, in May of last year, they wrote about, quote, my latest uh, tyaneptine binge, which has skyrocketed my tolerance, and hoping to finally kick Taya, references to an unscheduled antidepressant that produces an effect similar to opioids, which is banned in 12 states and commonly sold at convenience stores. In May of 2022, they wrote, Coke, then opiates is always my go-to. I only speedball if I have enough opiates to redose when I'm out of blow. Isn't this terrific to know that the vice presidential candidate is being advised on financial issues by this guy? I'm sure we won't crash and destroy the economy, much less crash and destroy ourselves. Psychotic Mammals repeatedly posted about suffering from an addiction to tyaneptine in a post from last year titled ODSMT, I don't even know, uh, for tyaneptine withdrawals. They wrote, I'm trying to figure out what the tyaneptine to ODSMT equivalent dose conversion is. He's so smart and technical about his drugs. I have a few grams of ODSMT coming in the mail because dark web. Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera, and hoping to finally kick the Taya using it. I don't know whether they call it Taya. It's, it's pronounced Taya Neptune, but T-I-A for short. I don't know whether they say Tia as a joke or what. Psychotic Mammal has also repeatedly referenced using Kratom, a substance sourced from the leaves of a Southeast Asian tree that mimics the effects of opioids. We know this now because we looked it up. Uh, and is often sold at corner stores and smoke shops. Two years ago, in a response to a Reddit user who was seeking pain relief, they wrote, I've dabbled in every drug you can think of. I'm so cool. Uh, By the way, the picture of him, not particularly cool looking. But Kratom is the one drug that really tripped me up and I found myself addicted to. Not sure what it was about it, as it's like a much milder opiate. But man, that stuff, we'll say, we'll help clean him up, was hell for me to quit. Uh, He's just so open and honest. Anyway, he's probably a really brilliant financial strategist. Sniff. All right, welcome back now to the K-Go in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I ran out and got a whole bunch of drugs to do the rest of the article with. I can't pronounce any of them, but uh, I hope you'll all uh, buy some on the dark web and we'll all just uh, take every drug we can find and then post pictures of ourselves using it. There's a an uh, embedded um, screen cap from his Instagram page, I guess. Is this or... Uh, maybe these are photos. I can't, uh, maybe two photos here. One is, uh, maybe his LinkedIn page. And then there's something else. This from, maybe this is the photo site they're they're talking about, but this time the username is not your mother's preppy. And it is, this is the photo site of him, uh, modeling his various preppy outfits. And boy, does he look like uh, and a <laughs> super a all. Uh, but hey, what can you do? Nobody's gonna look good doing this stuff. Anyhow, um, it's interesting that he spends so much time and energy trying to look like this. And uh, I'm not sure what to say, but this is him, as he says, styling my new to me vintage 1989 polo patchwork sweater. And uh. What an exciting development this is. Anyway, Wired's investigation continues here, showing that Kofsky appears to be closely tied to the Psychotic Mammal username across the Internet. In 2013, for example, Psychotic Mammal wrote that they were a ski instructor at the same resort, Boston Mills Brandywine Ski Resorts. 
that Kofsky lists as a past employer on his LinkedIn profile. Again, pretty damn specific if it wasn't him, which he spoke about to Cleveland Magazine in a 2014 profile of notable area students. In another post from earlier this year, Psychotic Mammal referred to the resort as their, quote, home hill. In a separate post from November of 2013, I was wondering about that because one of the pictures is of him uh, modeling his sweater is him uh, with the sweater and a uh, blazer over it, wearing a bow tie displayed above the neck line of this uh, crew neck sweater, and then wearing um, sort of a, some tan beige corduroys maybe it looks like a cuffed and rolled up to display extra length of his duck boots uh wearing big uh, round horn rimmed glasses a nice preppy haircut walking a poodle and carrying a pair of fat skis over his shoulder uh, in an area where there's no snow on the ground so i'm kind of wondering where he's going but just letting everybody know he's a ski instructor and has a bow tie and this sweater and the blazer. And uh, it's looking a little extra wide in this photo, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, but he loves rolling up the pants and uh, displaying the preppy shoes as well. So, I don't know. I just found that rather remarkable. So, okay, there's the ski instructor connection. In a separate post from November 2013, Psychotic Mammal replied to a post about a St. Vincent St. Mary High School football game, suggesting that they just went to the, uh, that they went to that school and correctly listing the final score of the game. Kofsky's LinkedIn account lists the Akron, Ohio based school as his former high school. And he is listed as a 2015 graduate in the school magazine. So just again, he's like 10 years old, 2015 graduated high school. So, eh, you know, uh, young guy, I, I don't know. This seems like a lot of time, uh, here spent establishing that this is the right guy and this is definitely him, uh, which is, I think, necessary if you're going to level these sorts of accusations against somebody working in the United States Senate and for a vice presidential campaign. Psychotic Mammal also shared a link to an Instagram account that had posted photos of Kofsky in a post to the Reddit subreddit here, uh, the Ralph Lauren subreddit. So, you know, opiates, Ralph Lauren, whatever. Uh, six months ago, the Psychotic Mammal account linked to Not Your Mother's Preppy, a men's style account that shows Kofsky wearing preppy outfits. Anyone know what sweater this is, the post says? The image of Kofsky used in the August Politico article also appears to be from this Instagram account. He's wearing the same vintage 1989 Ralph Lauren country patchwork sweater on the Instagram account and the image used in Politico. Before Wired asked Kofsky for comment, a Poshmark account with the username Psychotic Mammal started in 2018, used a photo of Kofsky as its avatar, and then listed the real name of the user as Aaron K. I mean, it seems to be stacking up here. A Blogspot user named Psychotic Mammal wrote about being Jewish and going to a Catholic school. What do you know? Experiences that match Kofsky's. So... What a Shonda. <laughs> he's, he's bad for the Jews. This according to the Cleveland Magazine article and a VSCO account registered with Kofsky's personal Gmail account, according to publicly available material from the data breach, also uses the name Psychotic Mammal. Look, we get it. It's him. As recently as three months ago, Psychotic Mammal posted to the subreddit Hydroxy... Mit oh my goodness. Hydroxy... Mit Trudgynine. Oh my goodness. Subreddit. I don't even know this drug. Asking for help locating one of the compounds found in Kratom in DC, Northern Virginia, or Maryland. I don't know. You can just drive all around Northern Virginia and look for bright neon signs in the windows of stores that say Kratom. So I guess if you want to build your own, you're out of luck. I can't help you any further than that. So there you go. Uh, fantastic news, and I'm sure good news for the economy. Don't forget that two years ago we were treated to the analysis from Bloomberg that we were 100% guaranteed to have a recession in the next year. It has been two years since they said so. Uh, 
And maybe part of the reason is that the people who make these guesses from the Republican side about the financial stability of the United States are complete crackheads. That could have something to do with it. So now we have that, which is nice. You're definitely going to want to go out and vote for him. And remember that uh, Donald Trump's brain is leaking out of his ears and he speaks in a death rattle. If you are voting for Donald Trump, you are essentially voting to substitute in J.D. Vance at some point in the near future when Trump himself either just drops dead or melts completely and a 25th Amendment Vance in and he runs the country based on the advice of the gas station heroin guy over his shoulder. Just thought you should know that. I didn't think any of you were really planning on voting for Trump, but, uh, you know, you, you do appreciate a good story about how uh, problematic this whole thing really is. All right. Uh, I have another item for you here from, uh, oh, and I didn't uh, uh, check out. I got to still have to search for the thing that made me think about uh, another story for you. And maybe I can, I don't know whether we can live on the air search for this one. But I thought it was really interesting in terms of like uh, evil genius sort of um, rat effing sort of thing that Republicans typically do. I wonder if I can come up with the thing. I just saw it on social media last night, and I don't think I put it aside. But uh, as we were reading through this thing and acknowledging, all right, well, it's possible, let's say, that you could have, this would be a long walk for no real reason. Like, if you were going to set up a fake online presence, to set somebody up to make it look like they were a total drug addict, you would probably make it about J.D. Vance, as opposed to a guy who once worked for, or maybe still works for J.D. Vance as a financial advisor uh, or a financial policy advisor. Anyway, um, that would be a long way to go. So that's, I think, speaks to the uh, to the genuineness of this discovery. Uh, but at any rate, last night I saw a story somewhere uh, that Elon Musk had, you know, of course, kicked in the, a ton of money to some organization or another, maybe even had established the organization himself and then funded it. And the idea was they were going to establish it and build themselves as a pro Kamala Harris super PAC or think tank or what have you, whatever form they were taking. And then generate a completely imagined false campaign agenda for Harris. First, you start and say, well, I'm pro Harris. I wouldn't be doing this if I weren't thinking it was good for Harris. So here's the agenda. And they were playing off of the Project 2025 thing. Now, Project 2025, as you know, has generated an awful lot of bad publicity for Trump and as a result, Trump has tried to disavow any connection to it. I don't know what it is. I don't do it. This is completely independent. They've got nothing to do with us. That's not our agenda, right? And that's very, very difficult to believe, and no one does believe it. Uh, so maybe, I guess, to try and reinforce that, this was a kind of a semi-brilliant evil idea. You fund a group, and if you have unlimited funds like Elon Musk does, you can just do it, whatever it takes, and you just say... I'm starting a group and you can declare when you're starting a group. What am I? All right. I am a uh, I'm a pro Kamala Harris super PAC think tank. And here is our agenda. And of course, the agenda is letting in as many illegal immigrants as possible. Oh, sorry. I'm doing the voice. I didn't mean to do that. But uh, open borders and free drugs for everybody. And we're going to give away uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security to all immigrants, no matter where they came from or whatever, or how they got into the country, and we're going to ban fracking. I think that one was funny. Like, all right, cool. Oh, wait, no, that's fake. And it's a whole fake agenda. And I think they ended up calling it Progress 2028, as though there were no way to make it more obviously an, a response to uh, Project 2025, Progress 2028, and I guess they are also thinking, well, they'll immediately disavow it, but then we'll point to Trump's disavowal of Project 2025 and say, you didn't believe that. Why do you believe this disavowal? And 
Well, one of the ways that you can disbelieve it is uh, basing it on, well, the whole thing was funded by Elon Musk. Oh, right. Well, at any rate, I got to dig up the story that uh, establishes that one. But um, I'm not sure whether the uh, whether I'll be able to dig up this article or not. Just because, uh, I don't know, I should have put it aside. But uh, I'll have to search around and try and remember what the social media discussion used in terms of search terms to come up with this thing. In the meantime, I will share this piece with you in the New York Times, in which it is stated here, Trump leans on creative bookkeeping, and you always trust Trump's creative bookkeeping, on what? To keep up in the cash race. Donald J. Trump's official campaign committee has a payroll of fewer than a dozen people. Did you know that? The official campaign committee. And has found ways for another account to pick up the tab for his rallies. That sounds like creative bookkeeping that won't hold up in front of a normal and functional federal election commission. But since we don't have one of those, I guess it's just going to work out in terms of his never being, you know, called out for it or prosecuted for the violation. Uh, now, also, I think I parked uh, nearby a, a comment on, yeah, this is it, from Paul Waldman, uh, not me, but Paul Waldman, uh, who says on Blue Sky, yes, this headline is a comical New York Times self-parody, but the story is incredible. There are only 11 people on the Trump campaign payroll. There is no way in hell that they aren't violating a bunch of campaign finance laws. And uh, now we can get to the incredible story itself and see just uh, what makes Paul say that about it. So, so uh, as he says, comical self-parody that New York Times would find out about these shenanigans and say, well, it's creative bookkeeping. Let's find out. Uh, Shane Goldmacher and Maggie Haberman, of course, Going to get a piece of this byline. Donald J. Trump's political operation has been taking extraordinary measures in a bid to stay financially competitive with Vice President Kamala Harris, deploying aggressive uh-oh, and creative accounting strategies that test the legal limits of how far a candidate can go to offload the core costs of running for president. Now, I don't know whether they make this observation in here, but I think I feel compelled to make it right now. If you are running for president, uh, and and he is, if you're running for president and it's basically down to this, it's either I win, pardon myself for everything, force the DOJ to drop every case against me, or I go to jail. It's either prison or the presidency for me, right? And that's the situation that we're in. And by the way, I remind you that while the election is about uh, two and a half or election day, anyway, the time they start counting the votes is about two weeks away, two and a half weeks away. Uh, we're about uh, two more weeks after that before he will be brought in for sentencing in the New York case, the 34 criminal convictions, unless, of course, they postpone it again for reasons unknown. But we're like 20 something days away from the end of the voting period and about 40 something days away from sentencing. But of course, the other federal cases against him now still in in progress. And uh, there's an update on that, too. Something new from the Jack Smith case. Anyway, uh, we are looking at prison or the presidency for him right now. So if that was the case and you were either out of money or uh, didn't want to spend your own money, but wanted to spend some willing billionaire's money instead to keep up appearances and make it look like you still had a campaign and you were told, but the thing you want to do is totally illegal. This is one of the dangers of the situation we're in. You just say, To hell with that. I mean, what do I care? It's totally illegal. I'm either going to prison or I'm going to be the president and I'm going to drop all the charges. So if if we have the good outcome, in my view, where not mine, his view that I wins the presidency, then who cares if the thing I'm going to do is illegal? I'm going to pardon myself anyway. And everybody knows, you know, everybody knew it was a well, what does he say? It's it's the the parody of the, the snake or the something. 
Uh, I don't really understand the parable of the river crossing story, but I don't think it actually involved the snake, but he thinks it does or something like that. Anyway, you knew I was a snake when you voted for me. So either just do the illegal thing and then I'll pardon myself or, wow, oh no, I'll be going to prison again for the things in this violation when I'm already sitting in prison for the rest of my life for the other violations. I mean, there's no, where he's literally in a position where it's, there's no way to lose here. Either he wins the presidency and pardons himself, or he's sentenced to another life sentence concurrently with the one he's going to essentially be serving for his other prior crimes. So why not? You know, right. In this case, he's totally unmoored from law and order in this. There's no legitimate, logical reason for him to obey the law anymore in any sense. And this is the easiest of his and most comfortable of his crimes, financial crimes. The most startling example of this is the official payroll of the former president's campaign committee. He had only 11 people on it as of August. That is a tiny fraction of the more than 200 people Trump had on his campaign payroll four years ago and more than 600 people on Ms. Harris's campaign payroll in August. Federal records show again, 600 for Harris, 11 for Trump. You think that's legit? The reason Mr. Trump now has so few on the payroll is that he is shuffling costs from his campaign committee to other accounts allied or shared with the Republican Party. The goal of the seemingly arcane accounting maneuver is to free up millions of dollars which would otherwise be locked up in party and fundraising accounts to spend on television ads for Mr. Trump. And the shifting of payroll is just one piece of the financial puzzle. Mr. Trump has also not been using his campaign committee to pay for many of the big rallies that are the signature events of his campaign. I should point out here that up to this point, maybe they'll explain it, but there's nothing terribly unusual about that for Donald Trump. If he had hundreds of people on his payroll and was paying for everything out of his campaign committee, it would still be the case that Mr. Trump had not been using his campaign committee to pay for many of the big rallies that are his signature events of his campaign, because he doesn't pay for anything. He stiffs everybody for this. There's dozens of of municipalities and counties across the country still waiting to be paid for police overtime and the like that the campaigns are supposed to cover for his 2020 and possibly even 2016 campaigns. I mean, he just loves to stiff contractors. So there's that too. But... In addition to this, he's engineered it so that he's not, the campaign isn't even the one on the hook for these things. He's using some other entity to stiff these towns. So, this all according to two people with knowledge of his accounting who spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss internal matters and didn't want to be named as co-conspirators, but eventually will be because we have to know who did this stuff. Instead, the Trump team is, for accounting purposes, treating those events as fundraisers by including backstage photo lines for contributors or donor roundtables. Isn't that interesting? Uh, he loves uh, overlayering these things. I still do contend that we'll find out that he siphoned off inauguration fund money to himself by paying himself appearance fees for going to his own inaugural balls. I keep bringing that up. But you see what kind of creative accounting he does to try to find ways to control other people's money or siphon it off to him. So, right, it's not a rally, it's a fundraiser. So I'm paying for it with a different account. How is it a fundraiser? Before I go on stage and tell the same stories over and over again, I let people come and take photos with me for $100. So the event is a big fundraiser that I close out by doing a two-hour rambling stage appearance. People love it. And why that's another explanation for why people are leaving early. It's a fundraiser. The part I came for is over. I got my photo taken. I don't care to hear these stories. I'm leaving. Some offloading of staff and other costs onto party or shared accounts is typical in presidential campaigns. A number of people working heavily to reelect Ms. Harris, for instance, are on the payroll of the Democratic National Committee. Of course, that's what the actional committee actually does. But okay. But Mr. Trump has pursued this strategy to the extreme. The extreme, I tell you. The spending of the rules to their breaking point, said Dan Weiner, the director of elections and government program at the Brennan Center for Justice. 
uh, says it's clearly exploiting some technical ambiguity in the law to do something that's never been done before. The combined savings on his rallies, the shrunken payroll and some online ads that he has also pushed onto joint accounts is expected to top $10 million and possibly far more. Brian Hughes, a spokesman for Mr. Trump, said the campaign was raising and spending money, quote, in a responsible manner. The Trump Pence can I'm sorry, the Trump Vance campaign. Remember the other guy? They tried to execute the other guy. The Trump Vance campaign and affiliated committees are in full and complete compliance with all election laws and regulations. Mr. Hughes said our contributions and expenditures are reported in compliance with those laws and regulations. The extent of Mr. Trump's cost shuffling, which has not previously been reported, will be revealed in new campaign filings this week. Some of the accounts that Mr. Trump has shifted expenses to have not had to publicly disclose their finances since June 30th. Another great way to keep things dark. Behind the scenes, Mr. Trump's advisors have spent months devising ways to shed as many costs as possible from his campaign's main 2024 committee to avoid what happened four years ago when he pulled back on some advertising amid a cash crunch in the late stages of the race. At the core of the Trump approach is the fact that not all cash is created equal in presidential campaigns. There are definitely some loopholes to exploit, but of course, he is famous for overly aggressively pursuing some of those things and finding out later on that honest judges will think, no, actually, you kind of had it wrong the whole time and you're going to have to pay a big fine, et cetera, et cetera. No one's ever tried to put him in jail for it, but uh, I don't know. We'll see how extreme it really is. And, and also keep in mind that some of this creative financing might have been driven by people who are total opioid addicts Along the way, I don't know. That guy that we were just reading about only advises Vance. We don't know whether there's any crossover uh, into Trump world, except for the fact that, remember, that Vance and his crowd were handpicked by Don Jr., who appears to be a bit of a addict himself to any number of substances. And so maybe he's the, the common thread in all of this. The money in a candidate's official election committee, the story continues is the most valuable. It's the money that generally must be used to pay for expensive television ads at the cheapest rates, right? You get uh, uh, the discount rates on TV ads only if you pay out of the official committee uh, funds. Uh, It's also the most scarce because that account has a contribution limit of $3,300 per donor in the general election. In contrast, the Trump 47 committee which splits its proceeds between the Republican National Committee, run by his daughter-in-law, state parties, and the Trump campaign, can collect checks as large as $924,600 per person. I don't even know why that's a limit at this point. But there you go. Each person can give about a million dollars. So the Trump team has shifted many as many costs as possible onto shared accounts like the Trump 47 committee or the Republican National Committee itself. The aggressive accounting appears to be a bet that the federal campaign watchdog agency, the FEC, Federal Election Commission, is unlikely to do anything to rein in Mr. Trump. It appears to be a bet on that. Plus, you know what I outlined, a bet on the prison versus presidency uh, issue. But it's definitely the case that before it even gets to there, the FEC will deadlock because it's evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. And they will deadlock and at a deadlock, a tie vote on whether or not to pursue charges on something like this means it's a dead letter and it won't even rise to that to the level where he faces charges that might land him in trouble or in prison for these crimes. It's just not likely to happen. Uh, right. So the commission is divided equally between Democrats and Republicans and has generally done little to dissuade or crack down on candidates who stretch the rules. And when they do, it's a fine, which Donald Trump considers a cost of doing business, I would add. In fact, an opinion from the Federal Election Commission earlier this year opened the doors for candidates to directly coordinate with otherwise independent super PACs for door knocking and get out the vote operations. Remember, When the deal was, well, sure, it's unregulated uh, and dark-ish money from billionaires in these super PACs. But remember, they can't coordinate, so it's not really worth as much as you think to the campaign. Uh, Except for now, we actually said, you know what would be great, actually, if we let them coordinate. Hmm. How did they manage that with a deadlocked board? I don't know. That they managed to do. 
but uh, not enforcing any of the rules. So the Trump team for months has discussed how it is relying on those new rules to save money. In addition to the payroll and rally costs, Mr. Trump's team has been using another account shared with the party, the Trump National Committee, to pay for millions of dollars in online ads that are virtually identical to ones that have run on television and have been paid for by the campaign. The difference in those ads is a thin strip at the top with white text that urges people to donate to Mr. Trump. That is enough, the Trump team has determined, we'll see whether judges agree, to consider them fundraising pitches rather than traditional ads that a campaign must foot the bill for. Ah, no. The joint account has roughly five, paid roughly $5 million for those ads, Google Records show. Last week, the FEC deadlocked, I can't believe it, on a somewhat similar matter involving Senate Republicans who were using shared accounts with the party to pay for TV ads that ask for donations. It'd be funny if they didn't let the senators get away with it, but it's okay for Trump somehow. The money Mr. Trump's campaign has saved on rally costs, payroll, and some online advertising is being poured into television ads in the race's closing weeks. Even as Ms. Harris has raised $1 billion in less than three months, Trump was set to spend nearly the same amount as her on television in October and November, according to data from Ad Impact, an ad tracking service. More on this after the break. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the K Going to Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's uh, continue on with this Times piece outlining the aggressive and creative accounting that the Trump campaign is using to shuffle money around and offload expenses traditionally covered by campaign committees to others, whether it's legal or not. And what would he care if it was illegal? What has he got to lose? The payroll savings, it is reported here, that Mr. Trump has achieved is substantial in July and August. Mr. Trump reported roughly $333,000 in payroll-related costs, compared with $9.25 million for Ms. Harris. Indeed, Ms. Harris has spent roughly the same amount on health insurance, $305,000, as Mr. Trump has paid his entire payroll in those months. Both campaigns also pay some advisors, including some of Mr. Trump's top strategists, through consulting arrangements which they then apparently used to buy gas station heroin. Uh, Mr. Trump's payroll is far smaller now than it was at the start of the year. He had 60 people on his campaign's payroll who received at least $3,000 in January. Records show. Mr. Trump has even found ways to subsidize the 11 people on his campaign's official payroll. Five of those officials also received paychecks from his PAC, Save America, in July and August, among them Walt Nauta, his personal aide and former co-defendant in the classified documents case that was dismissed by a Trump-appointed federal judge, Eileen Cannon, you know about that. Mr. Trump's PAC has chiefly paid for legal fees during his presidential run, but supported his political operation after he left the White House and until he declared his 2024 candidacy in late 2022. The rally savings are big, too. The price tag for his bigger events typically climb well above $100,000. Not that he pays them, but the bills go that high. For instance, Mr. Trump and Ms. Harris both held rallies this summer at the same site, the, oh my goodness, uh, Lyacurus, perhaps, Center at Temple University. Ms. Harris used the arena for her splashy rollout for her running mate, Governor Tim Walls. Her campaign committee reported paying Temple University more than $325,000 around the time of the event record show. Mr. Trump held a rally there in June, but his campaign 
did not foot the $108,100 rental fee, according to federal records. His joint fundraising account, the Trump 47 committee, did. Whether or not they actually paid that bill, I do not know. And not sure what accounts for the differences, except that uh, maybe they had to pay for the entire arena for Ms. Harris, but only a section of it for Trump because they couldn't fill the place. I don't know. But anyway, it'll be interesting to watch whether well, once he loses the election, whether the FEC is able to take any action and whether or not it requires FEC action for anybody to bring any charges about some of these questionable accounting decisions for which Trump has landed himself in court in the past and found out that he was on the wrong side of the law. Uh, but, you know, like I said, presidency or prison. And just I wanted to point out again how dangerous that is. I mean, everyone sort of has this inherent understanding of how weird and un-American and unfair and dangerous it is. But I think it's I don't know if the the observation's been made before, and I imagine somebody must have come up with this before, but how, I mean, just the the remarkable situation we find ourselves in in this election, that there's one candidate who essentially has nothing to lose by breaking any law they find inconvenient. But on the other hand, that being the case, I don't know, maybe you shouldn't tell him about it at this point, but why isn't he doing more, you might wonder. I mean, I do wonder sometimes what is constraining him from just saying, why why don't we just start? I mean, I don't want to give him any ideas, but why don't we don't just start breaking all the all the laws in, in, in their entirety? Why not go out and beat up campaign staffers for Harris or or fire tear gas into Harris rallies? Like who's going to be arrested for that? Well, the, they'll probably pick people up and put them away for a little while and they'll have to make bail and that's kind of troublesome. So I guess they don't want to buy into any part of that trouble, but certainly anything that would land personal liability for Donald Trump uh, is is not of concern at this point. You might as well go ahead and do it. One, it'll be months before they decide that there really even is any liability to attach. And two, I'm either going to pardon myself of it uh, if I either win the election or somehow seize power afterwards, or it doesn't make any difference. The the things that they're going to put me in prison for already uh, will run concurrently with these sentences anyhow, and it will make no difference. That's pretty, I mean, liberating, I guess, from his perspective and super effing dangerous from, for the rest of us. Okay, so I mentioned, let's see, that there were a couple other things. One I want to double back on. I did remember where I had seen the other story I wanted to share with you. It was from opensecrets.org, which brings us, uh, thanks to uh, the, the byliner here, do we consider them reporters? I guess Open Secrets has sort of a news function as well as just, hey, let's use this to look up FEC reports. Anna Masoglia, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, gets the byline on this October 16th piece. Pro-Trump dark money network tied to Elon Musk behind fake pro-Harris campaign scheme. Hell, why not try it, right? I'll pardon you too, Elon. This is kind of, you know, have to acknowledge this is kind of an interesting idea uh, even if it's an evil one, an initiative called Progress 2028 that purports to be Kamala Harris's liberal counter to the Conservative Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 is actually run by a dark money network supporting former President Donald Trump. How odd is that? Building America's future. The dark money group at the helm of the network has steered money to a constellation of groups and initiatives boosting Trump's agenda and spreading messaging aimed at chipping away voters from Harris. The dark money group reportedly received a hundred million dollars, over a hundred million dollars in funding from billionaire Elon Musk, along with other donors. The New York Times recently reported. I think I missed that report, but I'll open it up. Is linked here. Republican operatives function as hidden hand behind pro-Trump efforts is the name, the title of this piece from the 15th. Maggie Haberman involved in that one, too, along with Theodore Schleifer, Schleifer. I don't know how he pronounces that. Uh, that subheader reads a political nonprofit organization called Building America's Future has raised and spent more than 100 million dollars over the past four years. Uh, so hard to pin down 
yeah, Elon Musk's politics. It's difficult to know. $100 million. Hmm. The newest effort to benefit from their largesse uh, is Progress 2028, Building America's Future, registered to use Progress 2028 as a, fic- as a fictitious name, which sounds like something you shouldn't be able to register, but hey, okay, you'd be doing business as, I guess, Progress 2028 on September 23rd. So it's a long-standing pillar of the community. And the website was created three days later, Open Secrets' analysis of corporate filings and DNS records found. The Progress 2028 site appears to be created by IMGE LLC. I don't know if that's image, you would say, or IMGE LLC, a firm run by Republican political operatives that the New York Times described as the hidden hand behind Building America's Future. And a page on the Progress 2028 site includes the firm's sizzle reel, about which I know nothing, but okay. Uh, Image LLC, we'll call them that. Why not? Has also done work for Elon Musk's America PAC and several other Republican political committees, including a super PAC funded by America's Future Fund, named Future Coalition PAC. This is like interlocking, uh, you know, subsidiaries of all sorts. This is uh, a familiar game in Trump world, certainly. Uh, but let's see where we were, including a, uh, I better start this one over again. Image LLC has done work for Musk's America PAC and several other Republican political committees, including a super PAC funded by America's Future Fund, named Future Coalition PAC. As first pointed out by Brendan Fisher, Deputy Executive Director of Documented, an investigative watchdog and journalism project. So a lot of new entities to learn about here. The Progress 2028 Manifesto draws clear parallels to Project 2025, a controversial blueprint for restructuring the executive branch under the next Republican administration. The Project 2025 blueprint was developed by the Heritage Foundation and written by many conservatives who worked in or with Trump's administration. Project 2025 has drawn intense criticism, and the former president has said it does not reflect his own priorities should he return to the White House. But that's a big lie, and he does. I wonder to what extent the idea of offloading all of the employees to other entities besides the campaign has allowed them to say that Project 2025, though it involves lots of people who are in the inner campaign circle, none of them actually work for the campaign. They just work for one of the dozens of entities that funnel all their money to the campaign or funnel all their money in directions as directed by the campaign on behalf of the campaign. But nobody officially on the campaign works for or put any work in on Project 2025, therefore yada yada. But since no one believes it, I guess it's just an accounting trick now. Some of the policies listed in Progress 2028 highlight disproven and misleading claims about Harris's positions. Policies listed include, quote, empowering undocumented immigrants, building our future, and expanding Medicaid to undocumented immigrants. Undocumented immigrants are the backbone of our country, it says. And by removing barriers, we unlock incredible potential, the document states. Kamala Harris believes that every person, no matter their immigration status, deserves access to basic health care. And that might actually even be true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it gets paid for in the same ways. But certainly every human being has the deserves direct access to basic health care. Whether or not we're doing it, I can't tell you. Harris expressed support for allowing immigrants residing in the U.S. to obtain health insurance with her 2019 Medicare for All plan, but did not indicate whether there would be a cost. Her 2024 running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, recently said that Harris does not currently support programs for undocumented immigrants to qualify for free government health care, free tuition at state universities, or driver's licenses. The document claims Harris will, quote, support policies that protect minors' access to gender-affirming care and ensure that schools provide comprehensive LGBTQIA education. That's a bit aggressive. And, of course, not actually your position, but it doesn't matter. Remember, this is a fake agenda that is designed to make her deny that it is her agenda. 
She is committed to banning fracking, okay. phasing out internal combustion engines, no, and rolling out the most progressive Green, do, green New Deal yet, which is, you know, uh, anathema, of course, on the Republican side. Another section of the Progress 2028 plan reads... Harris has explicitly stated that she won't ban fracking natural gas, but her campaign has sent mixed signals about her position on the regulation of gas-powered cars. Regulation? Yeah. Elimination? No. Some individuals have received text messages directing them to the Progress 2028 page. Quote, Kamala Harris will support a nationwide gun buyback program that will take dangerous weapons off our streets. Okay, but no. One text message reads, noting a mandatory buyback is the only way to keep our streets safe. Sure. Harris expressed support for a mandatory buyback of military assault weapons in 2019, but has expressed a more lenient stance in 2024, highlighting her own gun ownership. Uh, then a couple of examples of the sorts of things that they claim uh, or that they are advertising that she claims uh, embedded here in here, along with uh, a picture of Kamala Harris holding a microphone, then the headline, did you know? And then enclosed in a uh, comics, comic book style um, uh, uh, speech balloon, which is not actually attributed to her or pointing towards her picture is just sort of hanging out there in the air along with the comic sans uh, font as the daughter of immigrants Kamala Harris knows the importance of removing barriers to opportunity Kamala will ensure that immigrants can access affordable housing and obtain driver's licenses with ease giving them the tools to fully embrace the American dream it's not they're not saying she said it they're not saying anybody said it they're just putting it in a speech balloon to make it look like somebody said it and then it says below, let's get ready for the next phase in Kamala's bold progressive agenda. And then a click here button, you know, learn about her plan, except it's not her plan. How interesting. Progress 2028 has also started pouring money into digital advertising. That was, I guess, their digital ad. Since October 11th, several digital ads on Facebook and Instagram have included a disclaimer paid for by Progress 2028, totaling over $36,000 in ad buys over just five days. While the ads appear to include pro-Harris messaging, they lean into contentious issues listed on the Progress 2028 site that have created friction among different divisions of the party. Let's remove barriers for undocumented immigrants who are undocumented. I say that enough times. Undocumented, undocumented, undocumented. One ad states, adding access to affordable housing, driver's license, and fair wages creates a stronger America for everyone. Another ad reads, a national mandatory buyback program means fewer guns and fewer tragedies. Kamala Harris gets it. Operating under a shroud of aliases, building America's future has funneled tens of millions of dollars in dark money from anonymous sources into campaigns boosting Trump ahead of the 2024 election. The dark money network also has a history of fueling initiatives, impersonating and parodying Democrats. Uh huh. Building America's Future is the top fundraiser for of Citizens for Sanity, a dark money group that bankrolled inflammatory ads mocking Democrats and progressive policies in battleground states ahead of 2022 midterms. Tax returns show the Wall Street Journal recently reported that Elon Musk secretly steered tens of millions of dollars through Building America's Future to help fund the effort. And, you know, the names of the overlapping organizations are so anodyne, you can't tell where it's all coming from, or which side even. Citizens for Sanity spent over $90 million on messaging, pitting minority communities against each other and chipping away at traditionally Democratic voting blocks. Similar to Progress 2028, the ads hit on contentious issues such as LGBTQ plus rights, immigration, and criminal justice reform. The ads have been accused of trying to suppress voting among minority communities. Citizens for Sanity does not disclose its donors, but other groups were legally required to report money they gave to it. That includes $43 million from Building America's Future, as well as $28.7 million from Freedom's Future Fund, a sister group of Building America's Future, and $13.4 million from American Commitment. But I guess the bottom line in all of this is, it's interesting. So the, the fund that's paying for it doesn't have to disclose who their donors are, but the donors had to disclose their donations made to them. And if you know where to look, you can piece it all together. And then if you really know where to look, it turns out that Elon Musk is behind all of it a hundred to the tune of a hundred million dollars. 
But nowhere is there a report that just says Elon Musk, $100 million to Trump. You got to you got to look all over the place and try to piece it together yourself. Thank God people are doing this. Next up, the many faces of building America's future. Building America's future has also fueled other pro-Trump groups and was the sole funder of the Future Coalition PAC, a new and new uh, that according to new FEC records filed on October 15th. So again, another layer to disguise things. A PAC, 100% funded by another PAC. Then you got to go find out who gave to that PAC in order to find out who is funding this PAC. The super PAC that has run ads targeting Harris in Michigan by highlighting her positions that are pro-Israel and the Jewish faith of her spouse, Doug Emhoff. The ads are reported to be pro-Harris, but have been criticized as featuring anti-Semitic dog whistles. The PAC has been accused of attempting to use the conflict in the Middle East as a wedge issue to a depressed turnout for Harris in Michigan, a state with a significant Muslim and Arab American population. Future Coalition PAC reported receiving $3 million from Building America's Future through the end of September. Another $16 million was steered through Building America's Future to Duly, or I'm sorry, Duty to America PAC, according to new FEC disclosures filed on October 15th. The super PAC has targeted young male voters and black voters trying to persuade them to vote for Trump. Building America's Future was also the top funder of Stand For Us PAC. You see how annoying and stupid this is? Open Secrets' analysis of FEC reports filed October 15th found the Super PAC received at least $3.8 million from the Dark Money Group and has spent over $15 million on ads attacking Republican primary candidates in Ohio with divisive messaging tying a prescription drug program to immigration and transgender rights. In addition to funding a cluster of political groups, Building America's Future operates under several fictitious names, such as Americans for Consumer Protection. Why can you operate under a fictitious name? They should just say there's one name and one name only. It's already confusing enough to have to go through 10 layers to figure out who's funding what. In August, Americans for Consumer Protection launched an ad campaign criticizing the White House's proposal to ban menthol cigarettes. CNBC reported that the effort was intended to chip away at Harris's base of black voter support in swing states, including Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. Whoever heard of those states, right? No one's concentrating on them. Building America's Future reportedly raised and spent more than $100 million over the last four years, the New York Times reported. Building America's Future is not legally required to report its finances, vendor payments, or outgoing grants for 2023 until after Election Day, and even then will not be required to disclose its donors. Open Secrets request for comment to Building America's Future and Progress 2028 not returned prior to publication. So basically, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is sort of set up to fail anyway, that the last FEC report is due October 15th. So you just commit all the violations uh, in open you know, in an open forum and in real time. But basically, it all comes out with almost zero time to analyze it. Thankfully, Open Secrets is actually dedicated to doing this and analyzed the October 15th filings on October 16th. So they could tell you, I could tell you on October 17th what they found, but it's like too late really for all of these violations to be highlighted and sink in with the voting public, many of whom have already cast their ballots anyway, but... There you go. Another, I mean, the system's sort of designed to fail in that sense. Uh, but I, you know, add on top of it again, a person running for office on the presidency or prison question, uh, does that person really care whether or not they're actually, uh, following the letter of the law or not? Mm, probably not. All right. A few minutes remain. Let's see what else I can uh, there were a couple other things I think I wanted to turn to and see if I could squeeze in. Mm. Oh, yes. Well, one was that there is news on the legal front. And then the other one, maybe perhaps we'll wait for Friday, which is tomorrow. It's coming up. Um, but this from NBC News, a report from Ryan Riley, Ryan J. Riley, in case you mistake him for someone else, that the judge in Trump's January 6th case, that's Tanya Chutkin, rejects the strained arguments about his false 2020 election claims. There was word that uh, uh, 
the motions were going to be considered and ruled on last week and that she was going to hold off on issuing the actual orders for a week. And now that time has come to judge Tanya Chutkin rejected most of Trump's lawyers attempts to compel prosecutors to hand over more evidence in their case. Here's what we've learned. A judge overseeing the federal election interference case against Donald Trump on Wednesday rejected the former president's claim that he was actually concerned about foreign influence and interference in the 2020 election. Hmm. Rather than the false claims about domestic voter fraud that he repeated in the weeks before the January 6th attack. There is, quote, no reason to believe that Trump's purported worries about foreign influence in the 2020 election quote, animated his concerns at the time, Judge Tanya Chutkin wrote. And if you remember, he was not talking about that at all. But claims that that was his real concern so that he can delay things further by demanding further disclosures from the prosecution and thereby delay his trial date even more should he not somehow seize power in the coming weeks. That there's no reason to believe that he was actually worried about that. And such evidence, uh, adding that Trump's theories that such evidence would be relevant to his criminal case, quote, does not withstand scrutiny. Trump's team had asked Chutkin to compel prosecutors in special counsel Jack Smith's office to provide them with additional evidence, including all information, quote, all information about foreign interference and influence efforts in the 2020 election. It's part of the Trump team's attempt to present Trump's concerns about mass voter fraud, which were roundly rejected by independent arbiters and courts, as, quote, reasonable and grounded in reality. The defense has maintained that Trump's false election fraud claims were plausible and maintained in good faith. So his pleadings before the court are, I really believe this stuff. So that that's the line they're going to go with in court. And therefore not unreasonable at the time, even though many January 6th defendants have since lamented that they were gullible enough to believe Trump's lies, like Trump's false claim on January 6th, that 139% of voters had cast ballots in the black majority city of Detroit. Chutkin pushed back on Trump's claims on Wednesday in an order that rejected all but three of his 14 categories of requests for additional evidence. About his request for evidence on foreign interference, Chutkin noted that the claims of election fraud Trump made as part of the alleged criminal conspiracy were, quote, totally unrelated to foreign cyber attacks. He's now claiming that was what was really motivating things, pointing to language in the superseding indictment that states that Trump's allegations of fraud revolved around his false claims that, quote, large numbers of dead, non-resident, non-citizen or otherwise ineligible voters had cast ballots or that voting machines had changed votes. At best, then, defendant might attempt to use information about these network breaches to argue that because of generic foreign cyber attacks unrelated to election results, he had reason to worry that foreign adversaries were would interfere in the 2020 election, which in turn somehow gave him a good faith basis to claim that domestic actors had perpetrated outcome determinative election fraud in non cyber attack forms. Chutkin wrote, that logic is too strained to meet defendant's burden. The federal grand jury returned a superseding indictment in August charging that Trump schemed to use a campaign of unsupported, objectively unreasonable and ever changing claims. They're even changing now of voter fraud to overturn his election loss and maintain the presidency. Trump has pleaded not guilty. To the four charges against him in that case, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to uh, obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding and conspiracy against rights. Trump's state of mind, if he has one, is essential to the case. And Smith's team has alleged that Trump, quote, knew his election lies, quote, were false. Chutkin also rejected Trump's request for evidence on undercover agents and individuals acting in the direction of official authorities at the Capitol on January 6th. He's still trying to say that the FBI did it. It was an inside job. A request that aligns with the false flag narrative promoted by some conspiracy theorists, including some Republican members of Congress, about January 6th. Trump, she wrote 
does not provide anything more than speculation that there were even that there even were any such undercover actors at the Capitol on January 6th. And there is no reason to compel the government to search for and produce that information. Chutkin also rejected Trump's request for communications by members, relatives or associates of the Biden administration, saying the sweepingly broad and undefined request utterly fails to meet the rigorous standard required for Trump to be able to make a selective prosecution claim. That's also part of his defense, right? Biden was only prosecuting me because he was covering up the crime that his entire family was perpetrating. So we demand any evidence that the government has that any of that happened. Well, they don't have any because there was none because it wasn't happening. But he wants to delay the trial for as long as possible. So he demands that they search for it. And then when they don't find any, he'll sue and say that's garbage, too. And appeal the decision. The judge said that Trump was entitled to three categories of information. So here's what he can get. Materials reviewed by former director of national intelligence John Ratcliffe before his interview with the government. Okay. Records about security measures that were conveyed to Trump during a meeting with General Mark Milley, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and acting defense secretary Chris Miller. And thirdly, evidence related to the unauthorized retention of classified documents by former Vice President Mike Pence, which Trump's team could use to potentially undermine Pence's credibility if he were to testify. He he kept secret documents. <laughs> Imagine saying that that's what undermines your credibility when you too are on the hook for that. Uh, but not anymore. It was dismissed. So he's OK. Now he's totally innocent and exonerated and everybody else is fully guilty. The Justice Department declined to press charges against Pence in that classified documents case. The Supreme Court gutted part of Smith's case over the summer. You all know about that. Then there was a superseding indictment. And I guess he's still on the hook for at least some of those crimes. In a statement uh, earlier Wednesday, Trump campaign spokesman Stephen Chung says, well, does he blame it all on crazed liberals in the deep state? Yes, absolutely. Of course he does. So we'll close it out with just noting the fact that he did that. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to Kegro in the morning with and you know what's coming next? The West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam. What's on tap? Brett Bear lied deliberately and knowingly about what Trump said he wants to do to Americans. He calls the enemy from within. Then, of course, on the rest of the menu, a roundup of news from around the country and around the world. As always, do stay tuned and we'll see you tomorrow.